I was thinking that uh, we would drill up through here and bolt the top frame on here. With this design, the whole roof structure becomes part of the rocket rack. Now, it turns out besides this legend, other people have strapped rockets to cars before, haven't they? Yeah, there are um, uh, world speed records that have occurred uh, by using this. In 1965, Walt Afrons built the first rocket-powered land speed car. Wingfoot Express II was initially designed with 10 JATO units, but that wasn't nearly enough. 25 rockets eventually blasted the car to an unofficial top speed of 605 miles per hour. Of course, you have to remember that those are unusual cars. They're usually very long and you They're know, built like for They're basically rocks this. with wheels. Yeah. So this also begs the question, where do we fire this car off? There are some lakes, uh, lake, dry lake beds to the south of here towards LA, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably try one of those first to see whether we can get access to something like that. Jamie's having second thoughts about getting behind the wheel. If this behaves like the legend says, it, it's, we're going to have a 3,000, 3 to 4,000 pound projectile out there. And I guess the other thing that I thought with that in mind, if we do lose control of it, obviously we don't want to be in the car. So we're probably going to... Uh, you I don't think want to be in the car? I would love to be in the car. <laughs> um, but I uh, think you should drive the car. Well, uh, I, I think I should too, but we've radio controlled cars before and it's a lot of fun. So. Oh, so we'll make it radio controlled. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the safest way of dealing with it. Oh, that's you know, the coolest toy ever. Yeah, this is a, it's a big kid's uh, RC <laughs> car. <laughs> you do it? It's not quite as simple as a radio controlled toy. At 300 miles per hour, the forces on the steering servos will be immense. Servos are motors that are positionable, so we can precisely control the steering on this. We need to have something pretty good because if it's going that fast, you know, we we need to really be able to dial in on the aim, or it, you know, it may go out of control. The transmitter also has dangerous limitations. One of the things is that these radio controls are only good for uh, you know a thousand meters or so, uh, uh, plus or minus. About half a mile. Yeah. For us to, if this thing is going you know 300 miles an hour, it's going to get out of range from us real quick, even if we're driving alongside. So we're probably going to have to think of, uh, of ways of uh, either getting a really, we're going to have to go out and rent a really really fast car, or we'll have to uh, get a helicopter. It'd probably be the safest way of dealing with it. I'm going to try and start it. All right. <laughs> yeah! Jamie's going to need every bit of control when he hits top speed. At 350 miles an hour at Chevrolet Impala, all the windows will pop out of it and the roof will pull off. Andy Granatelli knows all about speed. He holds 21 Hall of Fame records. Many were set in conventional vehicles. He claims the top speed for a street machine, an awesome 241 miles per hour. At this velocity, wind resistance is the biggest enemy. The uh, car would become airborne at a little over 200 miles an hour. The car would just raise the front of it up and flip over, in other words, because the air would get underneath the front of the car. Yeehaw! Jamie plans to use the Chevy's hydraulics to combat those forces. Lowering the hood should give considerable aerodynamic efficiency. It will also help with what he's been told is the most vital factor. The most difficult thing about this whole deal is probably getting this straight on the car. There's no real true center line that, that we know is, is actually where, the direction the car is going to go. We have... According to the, the experts, uh, a, a six degree misalignment is going to put about 100 to 150 pounds of push on right. the tail what of the I'm car. That way. All right. Yeah, that's as good as anything. So that's right about 86. And that's right about 86. Beautiful. Let's pack this puppy down. 
I can't wait to set this thing off. I'm going to be in a helicopter, uh, and I've never ridden in a helicopter before, uh, radio controlling a 3,000 horsepower rocket driven radio controlled car. Uh, what could be better? You, you know, you could just I, I, kill yourself when you were done because it's like, it's it ain't getting hell, any better than that. It's all going downhill from there. <laughs> Channel. Hi, I'm Andy Granatelli, and you're watching Mythbusters. And so the fun begins. It's such a treat to see the sunrise over the desert. By saying it's a treat to fire a rocket car in the desert. <laughs> Finally, all the pieces are coming together on the lake bed. With a bit of luck, we'll soon know if the Jato rocket myth is indeed possible. I'm just setting the fail-safe on this. These radios actually uh, uh, leave a, an instruction with the receiver uh, to return to a certain position if they should lose uh, communication. Yeah, they could. Jamie will be joined in the chopper by Eric Gates. He and his brother Dirk have over 20 years' experience in amateur rocketry. They plan to fire the motors by remote control. He's gonna do a dry run in the car. The uh, rocket guys, I think, are gonna do a test fire, so all systems are good. I expect it's probably about an hour to uh, actual firing. control and failsafe are working perfectly. Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not at all happy. Uh, the reason being that, uh, that unless something goes wrong on the first test, uh, it makes me nervous. <laughs> because that means something's going to go wrong later. How you doing? Adam Savage. If this new visitor is right, Jamie may just get his wish. I looked at it, and the, the mount's not strong enough, number one. The mount's not straight either. And we warned him about straightening the mount. It's got to be dead straight or it'll just tear the car all the time. George should know. Not only did he work on the Apollo program, he's conducted numerous speed trials out here. Eight points welded into the frame of the car. I hope it works. I mean, you know, because I don't want you to dig up my leg bed. <laughs> Not exactly comforting words for our final briefing. The helicopter's going to do a pass around just like we did the last time. About the time that it passes in front of the car, I've released the brakes and the car is going to start to roll. Like the myth, to, to our plan is to as, get the car up to 80 miles per hour before that, firing the rockets. Giving it a lot of gas. When the motors go, they're going to have a tendency to scare you. So when you're hearing the three, two, one, brace yourself. Don't veer. You sound like a jet engine. It's going to get a 15-foot flame out the back. 15. Let's have a good bird, man. Yeah. Get your game face on. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> this is so exciting. Bad. Cardboard box. It's a the I'm going to have to have a grinectomy. <laughs> Green light to go. They're starting their circle now. Brakes are coming off. We are a go. Nothing's happening. We're aborting. Yep. We're aborting. We are aborting. We are aborting. Okay, helicopter's coming in. 
it go through the inside? So how do you get it? Uh, how do you Looks get like it? the car's old gremlins are back to haunt us. Yeah, there you go. What does it look like? With all the focus on horsepower and thrust curves, we never did fix that fuel problem. When the problem is that this is an older car, and we've uh, uh, we've been stirring up uh, sediment in the bottom of the tank, and it's gotten into the the fuel filter and clogged the fuel filter. All we have to do is pull the filter out and flush it out once in a while. And we'll, we should uh, we should get a good run here soon. That sort of answers my uh, my need for a, uh, a a small failure. I'll I'll accept that one as a small failure. Chopper's top speed is 130 per hour. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. We lost track of it. Oh uh, yeah, it just it was a, we couldn't keep up with it with the helicopter. It just once those those things those suckers lit, lit it just like. <laughs> it's one thing to see him go up; it's another thing to see him go horizontal. <laughs> the dust trail from the car is so beautiful. <laughs> No, I was quite impressed. I, I, uh, I was hoping it would go good, and it did. You know, I was a little apprehensible, but no, no. Jamie did his homework. Over the years, many have claimed they were the inspiration for this story. For those who really tried it, the results were the same. In 1957, Dodge was filming an ad on this same lake. They replaced the gas tank with a single Jato bottle. The car topped out at 140 miles per hour. So, Jamie, given the structure of the original myth that uh, the guy ignited the rocket, accelerated to like 350 miles per hour, supposedly hit the edge of a curve of the road and was airborne for several seconds before hitting the side of a cliff, do you think it's possible? Didn't happen. Yeah. They'd have to have at least around four times the power that we did. Back in 46, Andy Granatelli and his brothers did just that. They put eight Jatos on an Indy racer. The explosion was horrendous, and the thrust was such that you couldn't believe it. We looked at each other as if we were going to, we were going to the moon. The rocket left not a little fizzle like this, but for a lot 300 feet long, for wider than the road and higher than the telephone wires, a tail of fire and the car accelerated up to approximately 180 miles an hour. I mean, and believe me, I mean, it was unbelievable. Andy's antics may well be the origin of the Jato myth. One thing's for sure, 